So, welcome everyone. I hope you can hear me. Um, my name is Steve Jennings. I'm a member of the FSC board, and FSC is hosting this webinar today. Um, and uh, in my my day job is I'm a partner at Three Keel, which is a sustainability consultancy. Um, if you're having any technical problems, um, please put a put something in the chat, and um, the wonderful people at FSC will try to sort out um, any problems you have. Um, for many reasons, I think this is a pivotal moment for the UK's woodlands, and it's gratifying um, that we have so many people signed up for this webinar, and I can't see just how many people are, are, are in attendance at the moment, um, but it, it looks like a very good turnout. Um, and the purpose of today's discussion is to share insights and expertise on what forests are for in the UK. There are many answers to that question, and in fact, more answers than there are people in the webinar. Um, so I don't expect a single answer to emerge, but what we will hopefully get out of this is to engage with others' perspectives and to learn something. We're very lucky to have four panellists um, today, which I shall introduce uh, later on, um, each of whom will give a very different perspective on, on, on what forests are for. Um, and in addition to that input, uh, we're really hoping for a good discussion, a lively debate, and lots of questions and input um, from everyone in attendance. Next slide, please, Owen. Great. Um, so, as I said, we have four uh, panellists, Rebecca, Stuart, Maria, and Owen, um, who is also controlling slides. Um, I, I will introduce them, them um, properly uh, in due course, but we are very lucky to have them um, and I certainly look forward to learning from them. Um, before we go into that, there's a bit of housekeeping I have to do, so maybe if you could take us to the next slide, Pete, please, Owen. So, some basic uh, house rules. If you could keep yourself muted, that would be helpful to avoid background noise. Um, for questions, if if you could please use Slido, I'll explain what Slido is in the minute. It was uh, it was a new thing for me until very recently. Um, and for technical questions, as I met, as I mentioned, if you could um, use the chat box or the question box in the GoToWebinar control panel, uh, which should be up on your screens uh, in, uh, to the side probably of of, of the slides, um, then uh, the staff at FSC who are running this webinar will will hopefully be able to correct any issues for you. Um, and finally, just to let you know, we will be recording the session um, so that and there are a number of people who, who wanted to be uh, at today's webinar, uh, but were unable to join for one reason or another and have asked for recordings. And we'll also post and send you all a link to a recording of the webinar on the FSC uh, YouTube channel uh, after the event. Next slide, please, Owen. Right, so slider. So as I say, we are hearing from, from four panellists, which I'm very much looking forward to, but the key part of today is discussion and debate. And obviously it's different doing that um, in a remote setting compared with if we were all face-to-face. -face. We're going to use Slido. Um, there's two ways of accessing it, and this will all be repeated later on when the time comes. So don't worry now um, if, you, if you don't absorb the details. You can either access it via your, your web browser or possibly the most effective way is to use, uh, we'll give you a QR code, just point your phone camera at that QR code, um, click the button when it says go to website and you'll be on the slide and you'll be able to ask questions. Um, you can also vote for other people's questions. So if there's an, another question that, that someone's posed which you really want to hear the, uh, the panelists' views on or, or it's the question you would have asked yourself, please vote for it and that will uh, push it up the priority list, but we will try to respond to all questions. If we run out of time to do so today, um, then we will get back to you uh, with by email um, uh, in the next few days. Owen, next slide, please. Um, so just to give a little bit of context uh, to this meeting, um, FSC uh, UK strategic priorities for the next uh, four years uh, are, are down on this slide and I won't read it all out, but I think the first three are particularly pertinent to, to today's conversation. 
Um, firstly, promoting the value of forests and demonstrating the impact and benefit um, of the FSC. Secondly, supporting FSC globally and encouraging stakeholder engagement to ensure the FSC system is fit for purpose, accessible, relevant and trusted. And thirdly, to improve standards for forest management in the UK for all sizes and types of forest. Um, and um, we are, as some of you will know, in the process of revising the UCRA standard, which is the standard for responsible forest management in the UK. Um, so now is a very good time for all of us to contribute your ideas and priorities for UK woodlands going forward. Um, and that's the context from a sort of, if you like, an institutional point of view. But I think all of you will be aware that there is a, a broader con context to this conversation today. The, uh, the biodiversity crash, climate change, uh, and the importance of woodlands and forests to people's well-being that has really been highlighted through the COVID pandemic, which unfortunately we're still living through. Um, but also the need to put uh, the need that all of those things uh, give to put the UK's economy on a sustainable footing. And forests and woodlands can be central to all of those things if we want them to be. Um, and I think that's really the purpose of today's conversation is is to think through what do we want. The UK's woodlands to do for us. Next slide, please, Owen. So, um, as I mentioned earlier, we have four speakers today. I'm going to ask each of them to keep to five minutes. I won't be, I won't cut you off after five minutes, but I, I might send you a, a message in the chat box, in the GoToWebinar chat box. So, if I could ask you to keep close to five minutes so there's plenty of time for questions at the end. Um, I'll introduce each one of them uh, by name. Um, so maybe you could advance the slide again, Owen, while I just briefly um, introduce Rebecca. So Rebecca is the Chief Executive of Rewilding Britain. Rewilding Britain is dedicated to the large scale restoration of ecosystems to the point where nature is allowed to take care of itself. Um, it also engages in research, advocacy and practical rewilding projects uh, and with rewilding groups throughout England, Scotland and Wales. And Rebecca will be talking, will be taking primarily an environmental perspective um, on the question of what are forests for. Rebecca. Sorry, the old, the old trick of unmuting yourself. Um, thank you, Steve, and uh, thank you for inviting me to come along today. Um, I'm really interested, I mean, I'm primarily be really interested in, in the discussion because I think I've got a lot to learn from, from everybody, um, both uh, panellists and uh, participants. But um, so I suppose I'd just start with some thoughts about what a forest for. And, and for us, that's part of a broader question of, of what are we asking of the land um, more broadly. Um, which kind of influences my my response to the question. Um, and obviously, we what are we are we're, what we're asking of the land is um, is resources, is food and timber and, and and all the products we get from the land. But the land also and and nature and the resources also provide us with our life support systems. Um, and I think we all know that with the recent code red warning from the IPCC. Um, that things are not going well with our life support systems in terms of climate, in terms of um, ecological emergency, but also the health and well-being of, of people. Um, and you know, thinking about the targets that we've set ourselves, the uh, you know, we would agree with the 30% in nature's recovery by 2030 target that leaders have now signed up to, and very much the net carbon zero by 2050, if not before, if we are going to avert climate uh, and ecological emergencies. So um, we, you know, we very much um, support that, and we want we see rewilding as being a sort of mainstream part of that. But what 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 is rewilding? I mean, that, that's quite a quite a question. And for us, rewilding is is really the large scale restoration of of naturally functioning ecosystems to the point where nature can take care of itself. And but within that, we have five principles because um, because for us, it's not just about nature for us people are part of nature we are part of um, nature's web of life and so we can't separate people from from nature and I think that's one of the mistakes that's happened in the past um, so for us it's about working with people and nature together it's about working at nature's scale so um, so and that can happen through 
a large scale plot of land, but also through connectivity. It's about letting nature lead. So it's, a, it's an approach focuses on reinstating natural processes. So the the um, complexity of structure and um, uh, and diversity of nature and free flowing rivers and natural balances of predators and prey. Um, so it's all about natural processes, but again, it's also about people and it must work economically as well as ecologically. So it's about creating nature-based economies, but also um, seeing those benefits in the longer term. Um, and for us, rewilding is a scale. So not you know we may want to see naturally functioning system ecosystems but um there are also types of rewilding that can be partially re restoring natural processes and that's where i think the sort of forestry element and woodland creation comes into it we'd like to see much more rich mosaics of um multi-purpose woodlands and land uses which enhance nature but also pr pr produce resources um so within that 30%, what we'd like to see is at least 5% core rewilding. So uh, natural, process, excuse me, natural processes restored as much as is possible. But then within a mosaic of the 25%, which would be nature enhancing land uses, which where the, where the multi-purpose woodlands could come in, where there could be some forms of um, timber production and um, timber, non-timber forest products, for instance. But that then leaves, if we've got 30% um, in nature's recovery, it also leaves 70% for more higher resource uses where you might want to have more intensive forestry, for instance. So um, we would like to see in the future um, rewilding mainstreamed within a much more integrated approach to both forestry, but also to wider land use. Um, and we'd like to see um, integrated locally led plans, which um, look at the broader answers to that question about what are we asking of the land. Um, we'd like to see more mixed models of, of, of land ownership, um, because I think that can accrue benefits to local communities, as well as create innovative models where we might have local sawmills, for instance, and local processing and adding value, value um, to the timber products locally that could see more benefits to local communities, maybe more microforestry um, models. Um, at surrounding and connecting areas of core rewilding where we're seeing some of our most amazing um, natural woodland ecosystems return and be restored. Um, so I suppose for us, um, it's not, a, what we want to see is integration and not opposition. It's not people over here and, and, and nature over there. It's not forestry over here and rewilding over there. It all needs to be part of an integrated approach, a strategic approach. Um, a long-term approach. And that's where, again, I think some of the forestry models could be really interesting because you inherently take a much longer kind of time frame or look at things with a longer time frame than say um, some of the farming practices. So we'd like to see rewilding integrated into um, other land uses, into forestry, uh, into farming and into the way that we uh, use our natural resources so that we can boost uh, nature's recovery. We can boost um, carbon sequestration so we can become nature positive and hopefully at some point carbon negative. Um, so that's the that's the models that we would be really interested in discussing with you because I think we've got a lot to learn um, from the approaches that the FSC and foresters around the country are taking. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Rebecca. So lots of food for thought there about um, nature's recovery, um, about the, the potential role of, of, of woodlands and forests, both in the core of, of restoring uh, natural functions, but, but also as part of a comp complex, integrated, locally planned uh, mosaic that allows us and nature to thrive. Um, that's great. I'm going to move, we'll, we'll have all all of the four presentations before we open questions, but um, I'm sure that's inspired some thoughts and questions for you, uh, uh, in all of you, for Rebecca. So please hold on to those for a while. Um, and I'll pass on to Stuart. So Stuart um, is a certification and environment manager for Scottish Woodlands. Scottish Woodlands is a leading forestry management company. Um, I, I, if, if I understand correctly, um, the company is, uh, delivers over a million tonnes of timber per year to UK timber processors, managing over 200,000 hectares of forest properties and planting more than 25% of private sector new woodland expansion. So um, you're a busy man, Stuart. 
Uh, yes, indeed, indeed. Uh, and thank you very much to Rebecca. It's amazing how much uh, of her uh, presentation I think will chime with what I've got to say. Um, you know, when I went to university in 1978 to study forestry, the big themes at the time were saving the whale and acid rain and also deforestation in the Amazon. And I think climate change was only just beginning to be discussed. Shame we hadn't discussed it a little bit longer. Anyway, I don't think my 18 year old self would have perhaps um, couched um, it in these terms that is now on your screen, but I think that's my raison d'etre for being a forest manager. Um, there is a piece of film I think that many of you have seen of an orangutan in Malaysia, confused and frightened as a large excavator gradually destroys its habitat around it. It's really hard to watch, at least I find it hard to watch. But it's very easy for people to dissociate themselves from that and blame someone else. But in actual fact, we're all to blame. The current rate of deforestation in uh, the world is 10 million hectares per year. And on that great scale of things, it starts with postage stamps and goes through uh, London buses and elephants, uh, eventually ending up around the area of Wales. Well, that's five times the area of Wales. And deforestation is the second largest contributor at 11% to global CO2 emissions. If you move on a slide now, um, please, Owen. Um, I think our global footprint in timber is quite shameful. Uh, the UK imports a net 25.8 million, that's 32 million less what we export of timber and timber products. We're the second largest importer in the world and actually equal in terms of uh, per capita at the top. EU estimates that between 20 and 40% of the timber that's logged around the world is illegally logged. So even if we're at the low end of that, does that mean we're importing 5 million tonnes of illegally logged timber each year? Remember that orangutan? Cost the UK PLC of 6.6 .6 billion. We cannot go on like this. However, let's have some good news and look on the bright side instead. UK, we have 3.2 million hectares of uh, woodland, split roughly 50-50, and sometimes I think it might surprise people just how diverse our forests really are. Timber production, we produce 10 million tonnes, which is 92% from that 50% that is conifer. And I'm rather sad to report that only 869,000 tonnes, or 7.8% of the UK harvest, comes from the other half of broadleaf. I think we could do an awful lot better with managing our broadleaf forests and at least triple that figure. But it didn't put this on this slide, but 80% of that conifer production is FSC certified. Everybody knows that we have one of the lowest covers, or second lowest um, woodland cover in the UK, 13%, only Ireland 11 is worse than us. UK average is 40. And probably it's no coincidence then that UK also has the lowest biodiversity of all the G7 countries. The World Bank is predicting a 4% year on year increase in demand for timber. So where's all this wood going to come from? Will it even be available? There is a bit of a myth um, that we would need several times the area of Great Britain to grow all the timber we need. But in actual fact, if we had a similar percentage cover to the average in Europe, and that maintained that 50-50 mix of conifer to broadleaf, and properly manage the broadleaves, we'd actually be close to self-sufficiency. A few more facts. We desperately need to decarbonize the built environment. For every tonne of steel produced, two tonnes of CO2 are released into the atmosphere. For every seven tonnes of concrete, it's one tonne. For every one tonne of, of timber we use in wood in construction, half a tonne is locked away. There is a bit of a myth that we can't grow good timber in the UK. So I'm going to quote Dan ridley Evans of Napier University. The most problematic thing that is said about homegrown timber, especially our spruce, is it grows too fast to make, making it too low density and unsuitable for construction. This very persistent myth is a significant barrier to getting more homegrown timber into construction and leads to a perfectly suitable timber being rejected and habitual over specification. Or to put it another way, follow the log. The UK has one of the most modern sawmilling and timber processing sectors in the world. And last year, we delivered 3.4 million tonnes of sawn wood to the construction sector in the UK. So we can do it. We just need to be a lot more positive about the achievements of the timber industry. 
There's also often said that broadleaf trees absorb more carbon than conifers. Well, actually, quoting Foster, Healy, Diamond and Stiles recently, under typical conditions, one hectare of newly planted commercial forest could achieve 269% more carbon mitigation than that delivered by a newly planted uh, conservation forest. Now, I don't give that fact uh, to knock newly planted conservation forests because I have to say I'm a great rewilding enthusiast as well. But the simple fact is that the faster the tree goes, the faster it absorbs CO2. And in the next 30 years, between now and 2050, which is the period that really counts, a typically improved Sitka spruce planted today will absorb nearly twice as much as an equivalent broadleaf tree. We also said that our forests are no good for biodiversity. Well, in May this year, an estimated 70% of the harvesting sites in southwest Scotland were on hold or restricted due to the presence of a nesting protected bird species. We commonly come across all sorts of protected species in our forests. Bats, badgers, buzzards, goshawks, white-tailed eagles, otters, pine marten, checkered skipper, black grouse. I could go on. I'm even told there are over 800 species of arthropods. And as we begin to break up and restructure those 1970s and 80s forests, we're getting much greater levels of diversity and both species and structural, and consequently much more biodiversity. We also heard in the last week that a paper had been produced that showed that even if the grey squirrel expanded over the entire range of the UK, the 20 forest strongholds in Sitka spruce forests and uh, commercial forests throughout the UK would be sufficient to save the red squirrel from extinction. The fact is that actually red squirrels, along with plenty of other species, really love our commercial forests. So I'm going to come back and maybe um, go in. You could go back a slide. Um, to that initial raison d'etre from my career in forestry. Um, and I would say, we can do it in the UK. We are blessed with high growth rates, a high percentage of certified products and a high level of environmental awareness. We've got a fantastic modern processing industry and significant opportunities to both sequester carbon and provide substitution for high emission materials. UK forest industry is worth two and a half billion to the UK economy and supports 32,000 jobs, largely in rural areas. If we don't seize the opportunity now and do something about our global footprint, it will be too late. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stuart. That's uh, a very good reminder of the potential, not just the potential, the actual contribution that the that, that UK's um, forests make to the UK economy and 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 uh, rural life, um, but also the potential of it, which uh, which um, you know uh, with the with the, the metaphor of the or the image rather of the orangutan, I think is very pertinent. Um, if I could now um, invite Maria to speak. So Maria Wilding is a program manager at Kleis Goidwig. Apologies for the pronunciation. Um, Thlais Goidwig is a 300 member strong grassroots network for community woodlands um, and aims to represent and support community groups and practitioners of community woodlands across Wales. So very, very much looking forward to hearing your views, Maria. Thank you, Steve. And I think as both Rebecca and Stuart have, have touched on, I don't think any of us are saying that um, forests are for just one thing. Forests have to be and are um, delivering a range of benefits for all of us. Um, and I think the challenge is, is not what forests for, but how are we going to make them actually fit? And how are we going to help them be fit to deliver that range of benefits? So I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, Slicer Goidwig and about community woodlands. Um, so Slicer Goidwig, and you did say you did a very good job there, Steve, of, uh, of the Welsh pronunciation. Slicer Goidwig, direct translation is Voice of the Woodlands. So Slicer Goidwig is, um, was formed by a group of community woodlands groups about 12 years ago and has grown from, um, I think, five or six in the beginning to we've now got over 100, so 104 full community woodland members and then probably upwards of 400 kind of associate members, supporters. Um, and between them, sort of in Wales, they manage um, at the moment, last count is just under 5,000 hectares of woodland, which isn't a huge proportion of the woodland, but I think as I'm hopefully going to um, explain a little bit later about, about the, the, kind of the range of benefits that come from community management of woodlands. And um, so we, we have quite a broad definition of a community woodland. Uh, we basically say that it's any 
woodland area, and that could be very, very tiny, um, that where the local community has some say in how that woodland is managed. And that can be a group of a community council group in, in an urban area managing several small pockets of woodland for the local community to, um, I think one of our biggest members is 300 hectares plus of woodland that uh, was bought by the community um, from Forestry Commission as well as Forestry Commission Wales as well as, and manages it for a range of benefits, um, commercial forestry as well as recreation, social benefits and, um, and for kind of um, social exclusion disadvantaged people. So they cover a huge range and I think one of the things that, that we always say as well is that if there's our members encompass between them every kind of every range of different sorts of woodland management, every reason for becoming involved in woodland, but also every problem that comes up. Um, you know, you name it, one of our members has come across it in the past, and one of the things we try and do is, is link them together to help them su support each other. And the, one of the, the kind of the, the main ethos, again, of Life Squirtery is that we, we want social and community forestry to become an integral part of that forestry sector. So linking with what Rebecca said is that, is that the forestry sector encompasses everything and all the possible uses and, and the, all the actors and stakeholders in um, that are out there because um, community woodlands can and do manage woodlands really well for a range of outcomes including the commercial aspects and the, the more health and well-being and social aspects and um, with the added benefits that a lot of the time those benefits stay locally um, and generally keeping those benefits within the community so they use local small scale local contractors they um, if they're producing timber it usually goes to local sawmills the um, they run events and they run services for local for local people and the, the kind of the, the well-being and the mental health benefits um, stay in those communities. So I don't think it's that community woodlands and community forestry isn't never is there never going to be a huge proportion of the forestry sector. Um, and we're not saying that all woodland should be handed over to communities, kind of lock, stock and barrel. Um, but we're saying that where it's possible and where communities have the capacity and the skills to manage those woodlands, and that's kind of where we come in. We do a lot of capacity building with groups and making sure that they have the skills to manage the woodland and woodland owners that they work with have the confidence that they can do it properly, um, that, that that's a viable option. Um, and that the needs of commercial and of social forestry um, and of you know managing woodlands for biodiversity and rewilding um, shouldn't be mutually, mutually exclusive and, and aren't really in many cases um, because it is possible to, to get and to support all aspects. Um, it's not easy um, and it may require perhaps different sets of skills but I think it is happening in in some areas it, we need to kind of probably roll it out a, a bit wider and I think something that we really need to do is to involve the local local people and communities in woodlands where they have that desire and need and so I'm only really talking about Wales there is also a community with association in Scotland who have different membership base because Scotland has a different historic kind of land use pattern and different um, political historical um, kind of priorities but they do have the same ethos as well is that as the communities can manage woodlands for local benefit for a huge range of um, huge range of different reasons and that um, that's something that we should be encouraging and it's you know obviously contributes to all the all the, the current political buzzwords foundational economy green economy green renewal um, and I suppose I suppose kind of just almost to wrap up community forestry is is maybe an extreme aspect of involving people in forestry um, a lot of people in communities aren't don't want to take on or aren't to get as, as involved as taking on the management of the piece of woodland but that doesn't mean that they shouldn't have a say in what happens in their local woodlands and that um, to the level that it's practical that shouldn't be included in in what and how um woodlands are managed and i think that's one of the things the reasons or where certification can come in is that increasingly um communities and small woodland owners and managers are interested in certification for the reassurance i think it brings and for the for the kind of like the um not rubber stamp but for the the recognition that they are managing their woodlands really well they are doing it sustainably and they can prove that through the certification route and um, I think that's one of the things that FSC is kind of beginning to realise and recognise that there are barriers to that happening but that doesn't mean that it's not something we should be looking at taking forward and that's me thank you
Great, thank you very much, Maria. And that's a really useful uh, reminder of the some of the important ways that people can be connected with woodlands and managing woodlands. You know, for for a range of different ends, um, social, um, economic, and um, environmental. Um, so it just reminds me to invite our, our final speaker, last but by no means least, Owen Davis, um, Forest Standards Manager for FSC UK. And as most of you on this webinar will know, the FSC promotes the FSC system, uh, which sets forest management standards for the UK by putting into the UK Woodland Assurance Standard, ACWAS, um, also provides an information service uh, and is part of the international network of FSC organisations that promotes responsible forest management throughout the world. Over to you, Owen. Thanks, Steve. And um, thanks very much to Rebecca, Stuart and Maria for um, putting forward their different takes on what forests are for. Um, my place in this is, is slightly different. Um, mine is to um, reflect on uh, how well those different viewpoints are um, currently accommodated within FSC certification in the UK. Um, FSC's mission, as Steve has touched upon, is um, is to promote environmentally appropriate, socially beneficial, and economically viable management of the world's forests. And you know, the, our three other panelists reflect those three strands um, of sustainable forest management. And I think it's really clear from um, what everyone has said is that you know, even if you are coming primarily from an economic angle or primarily from a social angle or whatever, I think. Everyone recognises the value of, of multi-purpose forest now, and and um, and although there are some conflicts, we can also certainly see um, synergies um, between these uh, these different aspects. But I think what's also really clear from the three previous speakers is that we're asking more than ever from our forests. We expect a lot from our forests these days. I think probably more than we we ever have. So really a key question for me, I think, from the certification side is are we getting that are we getting the balance between the three strands of sustainability right? Can we can we sort of get it right in a standard for every context, or can we at least provide the right framework that people can make the right decisions um, in each individual situation? Um I am going to talk, I'm not going to talk, really talk about FSC's international principles and criteria. I am going to talk more about UQOS, about how we implement that um, at the UK level. So on the environment side, I think it's worth remembering that right from the first edition, which was approved by FSC in 1999, um, UQOS has required at least 15% of um, a forest management unit to be, to be managed primarily for conservation. Um, Rebecca has mentioned the 30% target now that a lot of policymakers have put forward. Is the 15% right now in the context of certified forests? Um, that's a really interesting discussion that's going on right now within the uh, the UQOS working group as part of the revision of the standard. Um, FSC generally assumes active conservation management, although UQOS has also always had a requirement for natural reserves, so at least a proportion of the forest that is just left to its own devices um, obviously that that reflects the sort of a spectrum of um, of management interventions for um, conservation and enhancement of biodiversity and it's interesting to consider how those um, interact with the um, the principles of rewilding that Rebecca's mentioned it is of course worth remembering that conservation matters not just in natural reserves not just in that 15 percent of the forest um, but it matters throughout the forest and you know things like deadwood requirements within aquas um, are important um, in all parts of a forest and and, th and this is part of this interesting discussion happening right now during the revision of aquas is it more productive to in terms of conservation to increase the percentage that we um, that we where we really emphasize conservation or does it make more sense actually just to have uh, more of an emphasis on conservation throughout all of the forest including areas that might be managed primarily for other purposes most obviously production um, I think that I think this angle of rewilding is really interesting in the context of FSC internationally and nationally I don't think there's much in UQOS that militates against rewilding but also maybe there's not a huge amount that 
um, promotes it and whether it's appropriate for us to do that or whether it's appropriate for us to at least give explicit recognition of the role that it can play. Turning to the economic side, I mean, the productive function of forests, again, has, has always been a part of FSC, but I think some people would say in the standard, it's not a hugely visible part, but I think that's because from the beginning, the understanding has been most people have sought certification because they're trying to get access to certified markets. So there's no need to tell people to be productive if you like, that's their main reason for coming into FSC certification. But as Maria's touched upon, as time goes by, we're recognizing that there's a far wider range of potential motivations for um, certification out there. And that's partly coming through talking to organizations like Thysa Goidwig, but it's also through talking to organizations like the Small Woods Association. You know, it isn't, we have traditionally, um, traditionally in the UK, generally, you know, we have dealt more, well, no, I'm generalizing here. We have dealt a lot with the sort of big commercial interests like Stuart represents, but also some of the other big uh, land uh, owners who have a different perspective, the Woodland Trust, the National Trust, the RSPB, but they have a sort of specific agenda to pursue. We are recognizing now this wider variety of motivations. So it's how does how effectively does the standard um, steer them towards an appropriate level of, of productivity? FSC um, and, and, and UQOS does steer certificate holders towards a more diverse range of products and services. Of course, we talk increasingly now about ecosystem services. And as some of you may know, FSC has an ecosystem services procedure, which allows for the independent verification of various ecosystem services claims. That's all important. Ecosystem services are crucial to all of us, but also as Stuart has very clearly said, we do need wood from our forests as well, um, and other products, as, as some of Maria's members will be more interested in, um, including food products. Um, we need to make sure that those productive elements are, are properly reflected. As Stuart says, you know, we do have a moral obligation to um, to provide for ourselves. And, and Stuart's point about the difference in productivity between the conifer and broadleaf areas is a, is a really interesting one for a long time certification has, has pushed diversification of the forest and in particular has pushed a certain proportion of native, mostly broadleaf species. But I think we can all think of examples where all that's resulted in is a, is a scrappy little bit of birch in a Sitka spruce plantation that isn't achieving very much for biodiversity and isn't achieving very much for productivity either. Have we really done enough to make sure that these otherwise token gestures actually really achieve something, including productive functions? Um, and there's a whole other discussion as well, of course, about how we, um, how we generally bring a greater proportion of broadleaf woodlands into, into active management. Um, and something that's been um, touched on um, by Rebecca and Maria, uh, both I think, is about integration into the local economy. That's something that's been in um, in Aquas from the start, but I don't really know how effectively um, we've pursued that. Something else that's been in Aquas from the start that Maria touched on is, um, is involving local people in decision making. That's hugely important in FSC, engaging with uh, local communities and other stakeholders. But I think there's a, a big question to be asked about how effective that really is and whether it could be made less painful, I think, both for certificate holders um, and also for stakeholders. I, there must be ways to do that better and more effectively, I think. That's a good conversation to be had. And one thing I don't think we reflect terribly well, internationally or nationally, is what do you do when the certificate holders are the local people? So the situations Maria's talking about. We do have... Uh, certified community woods right now, but they are a minority. How well are we really representing that position? Um, and one other thing I just wanted to quickly touch on on the social side, because when we think about the social aspects of forestry, we're, we're often thinking about local communities, local people, health and well-being, recreation and whatever. But of course, the social side of things also extends to the people sort of in the forest, if you like. It, it extends to workers as well. And um, and that's a, a really important aspect that we mustn't forget uh, when we're revising um, AQUAS. AQUAS has done a lot over the years, I think, for um, increasingly for workers' rights, but, but very specifically in terms of health and safety, which we know remains a huge issue in the forest sector for all the strides that have been made. It, it remains a dangerous business to be in. Um, 
but is there more we can do? Is there more we can do for actors like um, contractors, where it's maybe not quite so easy as it is for direct employees? What what can we really do to make sure that everyone can have um, a safe and, and productive livelihood from the forest? So yeah, some really interesting questions, I think, about the balance between these different interests. But I, I do think it's clear from, from the previous speakers that nobody's talking about one aspect of this in isolation. It is about how we steer people to finding the right balance. Great, thank you, Owen. Some very insightful thoughts on striking the right balance and the different ways of striking a balance uh, within the UCWA standard and, 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 and some very interesting and personal thoughts about whether we're getting it right all of the time. Um, so um, I'd like to thank all four speakers, Owen, Rebecca, Stuart and Maria. Um, and Owen, if you could advance slides, we'll move into questions and answers. Um, so, um, as I said at the beginning, if you could use Slido for your questions um, and also vote for other questions that you want, uh, that you, you, you would like to see prioritised. Um, and use the GoToWebinar box for technical issues. Now, the instructions for Slido, I think, are on the next Slido. Uh, you've had the instructions for Slido previously, so uh, next we just leap straight into it. But hopefully you can explain it, Steve. There we go. Yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah, that, that's the one I meant. So, as I said uh, earlier, um, the easiest way to do it, I found, was just to point my, my phone at the QR code on the screen. When it says go to website, touch that and you'll go straight through to Slido um, and be able to type your questions in. If you want to join uh, via your web browser, um, Google Slido and use the, uh, the passcode hashtag 638137. Um, However you get to it, if it is by your web browser or your phone, uh, please type in questions. Um, if the questions are directed at a particular panelist, then, then obviously it's helpful to, to, if you could specify that in your question. And um, also, please put your name, although if you wish to win, remain anonymous, of course you can do um, as well. Um, and just, a uh, heads up, uh, hopefully people are beginning to put questions in, but right at the end of the session, we will be using Slido again for a different purpose, to, in fact, to suggest topics for the next webinar. So if, if as you're sort of thinking of, of questions and looking and voting for other people's questions, if you could also sort of have one part of your mind thinking what you'd like to have the next, uh, next webinar uh, on, that would be great as well. Um, so, I'm not sure if we have any questions come through yet. I'll perhaps people need a little bit of time to connect, in which case I shall use the chair's privilege and ask the first question. So to all panelists, um, what is the one action, the single action that policymakers and citizens could take to improve the role, the role that woodlands play within the UK? Maybe I could start off with, well, just in the order you spoke, so starting off with Rebecca, if you don't mind me putting you on the spot there, Rebecca. That gives me less time to think. Um, the one action. I mean, I think it links to, to this sort of integrated locally led plans. I mean, I think, you know, to, to ensure that, um, that we're involving everyone in, in answering that question. What are we asking of, of the land and of our forests? Uh, and people get involved locally um, and have a say. Um, and that that we can therefore locally develop plans which, which integrate rewilding and um, resource use and the production of timber and other products and food. All those, you know, integrate all those answers to the question of what are we asking of the land? Um, so I think that would probably be um, the next step is to support locally led um, integrated land um, uh, land use plans that integrate forestry, rewilding, nature, um, production of, of um, uh, the resources that we all we all need and use. Thank you, Rebecca. Maybe Stuart, you could uh, you could also hazard a, an answer to that question. Uh it's a really difficult question. The first thing that came to mind was teach your children. Teach them about the forest. 
brilliant. That, that's a superb and very, very concise answer. Maria. You just stole mine, Stuart. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you, are so, allowed, you are allowed to upvote other panellists' responses. <laughs> yeah, so, but the other thing I was going to say that we, we have a bit of a, um, on the social aspects, we do have a bit of a head start in Wales because we have the, the Wellbeing and Future Generations Act, which puts the duty on all public bodies to actually consider um, many of these aspects and all the social aspects here. So maybe one of the aspects was that everybody else should have one too. It's not been easy and it's not been of the, um, uh, I think it's it's taken a while to embed itself, but yeah, it, it's really good to have a hook to hang things on when you're talking to politicians. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Maria. And Owen? I think it's an absolutely brutal first question, Steve, <laughs> I have to say. Um, and I feel really sorry for Rebecca who had to answer it first. I mean, I'm answering it last and I don't have a good answer. Um, I, I think Stuart really nailed it. But if anything, I would go a step further back and, and say, you know, educate yourselves. I mean, what I think what today makes really clear is how much there is to potentially come from our forests if you look at them from different angles. And it's really understanding everything can be to us um, is, a, is a really terrific first step. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Owen. And, and, and thank you to all of you. Um, and apologies for that being uh, a, a difficult, a, a trying start. So we have um, we have some questions coming in. Uh, we have uh, something that's been voted for uh, three times, uh, which I think is to all of you. Um, and maybe we can start off in reverse order this time. So Owen goes first. Um, so are environmental, social and economic concerns uh, regarding forests all of equal importance? Uh, that is a terrific question. Um, if I were to answer it personally, I might give a different answer, but I will answer it from an FSC perspective and um, I will say yes. Um, I think those three elements of st sustainability we would treat as um, equal. Nothing within FSC sort of trumps anything else. Um, everything is of um, equal value. So it is it is about trying to strike a balance, I think, um, not thinking that any particular one of those is more important than the others. Thank you. Maria? Um, I, so my answer is they should be, um, and I'm not sure that they are. <laughs> uh, uh, that begs another question. Do you think one gets more priority then, or one gets more priority or less priority than the other? I did the second half of that answer, should I? Um, <laughs> it's, it's different in different areas, it, you know, that obviously, depending on who you talk to. Um, and I think that's the maybe that's the challenge for FSC is to make sure that that is reflected in standard FSC and of course, um, yeah. Great, thank you, Stuart. I always think the answer to this question is a bit like those Venn diagrams you drew at school. We had three circles that there was an intersection right in the middle, and the skill challenge and often the thing that makes a forest manager tear their hair out is trying to hit that sweet spot. And that's what we should be trying to do. And of course, one of the problems with the Venn diagram is that area of intersection is always smaller than the areas outside it. So the sweet spot, brilliant, thank you. Rebecca? Um, I think we, yeah, well, I think the answer is yes, like the other panellists have said, but I think it, it, it's again about embracing complexity, um, which we haven't been very good at, um, and learning from nature in that it is the structural and functional complexity of nature that it brings its resilience and you know it's it's nature has been surviving for for millions and billions of years um and evolving into the you know amazing web of life that we currently have even depleted as it is and and so i think we need to stop thinking in silos and stop thinking that it's farming here it's forestry here it's it's nature reserves over there and um embrace the fact that we have to address all of those things as part of of a whole um uh, and until we do that, we're we're going to get sort of competing incentives and 
um, competition rather than saying we all need to come together and say what are we asking of the land, what do we want to, it to deliver for us and, and for nature and for climate over the next 20, 30, 40 years and start some cathedral, I, I, I've learned the term recently, cathedral thinking, you know, when they built cathedrals, they weren't thinking of what would happen in the next two years, because it took 70 years to build them. They were thinking long term. So I think we need to bring some of that thinking into it as well. Fantastic. Thank you, Rebecca. So we have a question which uh, is um, which is top of the list at the moment in terms of popularity, which is for Maria. So Maria, do you think that woodlands can be successful and sustainably run by communities? In the UK, how successful do you think uptake will be? Unsurprisingly, I'm going to say yes here. That shouldn't be a shock to anybody. Um, uh, I know that there are communities who are managing woodlands successfully and sustainably. Um, we have, we don't, in the UK, we don't have the same culture of um, communities managing woodlands as, as other countries. I think we are having to um, reinvent it, if you like. Um, but yes, it can be done. And um, one of our kind of roles is to make sure that local people have the skills to do that. And I know one of the um, the kind of initial reactions sometimes to, to the idea of a community managing a woodland is, well, they can't, they haven't got the skills, they won't be able to do it properly. And the kind of the, the stock answer to that is, we're all part of communities. I'm part of a community. I'm involved in my local, in supporting my local community. Within every community, there are people with those skills and the people with the capacity to develop those skills. So it's not, you know, it's not necessarily that because not all of them are professional foresters, it's not going to happen properly and it's not going to be done to a high standard. It's possible. It needs some support and it needs a bit of, a bit of passion, if you like. And I think that's one of the things that characterizes all of our community woodland groups. Nobody goes into it um, just because they have the odd half half an hour of a Saturday afternoon. These are people who really care about and want to be involved um, in helping to manage their local woodlands. And, you know, they have the commitment to make that happen. So, yes, I definitely think they can. Uh, Rebecca, that was, sorry, thank you, Maria. That's a, a really, really super answer. Rebecca, I think you just wanted to add something. Yes, I just wanted to give an example of uh, of a community that really inspired me and I suppose sort of took me part of the way along the um, the rewilding journey that I've been on as I, uh, God, is it 20 years ago now I worked uh, for the um, World Wildlife Fund in Mexico and there was a community there called Ixlan in the, um, in the state of Oaxaca, which actually has FSC accreditation now. Um, I mean, it's slightly different in Mexico because the land is communally owned. Um, in many cases, but that community had come together and decided that they were going to sustainably log their um, their pine forests. So they got FSC accreditation. Um, they then came together and, and put a sawmill, a local sawmill in the community to add value to the timber and then a furniture making business. And then they looked at their cloud and rainforest and said, how can we um, both preserve it, but also um, bring economic benefits? So they set up an ecotourism business and then the profits were invested in three things, in the ongoing business, they were paid out as dividends to the community, and then young people from the community were um, supported to gain the qualifications and training they needed to then work in the, in the local businesses. So that was an example of, of a community running, um, uh, you know, uh, their forests uh, sustainably and for the benefit of local, uh, local people. Great. Thank you, Rebecca. We have lots of questions, so I'm going to move on. And the uh, next question is from Graham, who asks, Rebecca Stewart and Maria, please don't feel sad that you're left out here, Owen. Rebecca Stewart and Maria, which of the UpQuest requirements poses the greatest barrier to the achievement of your woodland management objectives? Um, Stuart, maybe you could start off with that one. I think one of the great successes of UpQuest 4 was the fact that when we took it to the, um, the, the APF show, it's the big forestry show, and we pinned the requirements uh, up in the, I think in the Confort tent and asked everybody what they thought of them, there was almost a universal uh, acceptance that what was up there was really good stuff. So my answer is, um, there's none of the requirements that are actually particularly onerous if you are doing your job properly. Um, 
and it should be relatively straightforward to get a, a FSC certificate um, within a group scheme or individually uh, if you are simply doing the job properly because although it's a high standard um, there shouldn't be anything in there that really causes you problems um, you know because it, it's it's the silly things that catch you out on it like you know people who have forgotten to put a sign on a um, high, dear high seat that says not for public use you know th those are the sillies that you get picked up on by auditors Really, there's there's nothing in Aquis which, if your your heart and mind's in the right place, should be difficult. Brilliant, thank you, Stuart. Uh, maybe Maria next. Yeah. So as for Stuart, I don't think there is one particular um, requirement that that poses the greatest barrier. I think one of the the things that is a barrier for smaller community woodlands at the moment is the, not the complexity of it, because it, the, the, the requirements themselves are quite straightforward. It's just navigating it and the, the kind of getting used to it. And so presented with a range of upwash requirements, cold, it's quite a difficult thing to get your head around. Um, and I think that for us and for our members, that's going to be the, the biggest thing is there's the support needed to access it in the first place. It's not going to be the actually achieving the requirements because, as Stuart said, they're doing that anyway, or they should be doing that anyway. Um, it's the actual the the system and the, the the getting through it. I think even just the first time is going to be the the thing that's going to be a barrier. Thank you, Rebecca. I feel at a slight disadvantage because I'm I'm not very familiar with the Aquis requirements, <laughs> having not I didn't do my homework clearly, but um, I think based on you know other certification schemes, but also designations, for instance, is um, the the extent to which they support a mixed approach. So if a if a an owner wanted to or or community or co combination of of owners wanted to um rewild part of their woods as in support natural regeneration and the highest possible level of restoration of natural processes and reintroduction of of missing species for instance if they wanted to mix that with maybe some low impact silviculture or continuous cover forestry um what we're finding in in the conservation sector for instance with designations like triple si's is they're so prescriptive that you actually actually can't do rewilding on a triple SI or it's it's very complex to do so because they're you know the requirements are focused on particular species so you have to sort of manage for particular species rather than manage for um reinstating natural processes so so it's kind of ironic that often the state of our triple SIs are, are worse than sur the, the surrounding land because the requirements are so um are, are almost working in opposition to to those rewilding principles so that that would probably be the thing I would want to take a look at if I'd done my homework. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I have to say I'm slightly, I'm not quite sure how to interpret those responses because it either means that Urquhart is just right and perfect or it's not challenging enough. I, I don't know, I'll leave uh, members of the audience to come to that conclusion themselves. Uh, we have a very popular question, uh, six people voted for it, um, and I think this is across for, for all the panelists, I'll start off with Owen. So just so you have a, a second or two warning, Owen. Um, so the question is, given large tree planting targets, how do advocates for expansion of forests counter the argument that it threatens food production and valuable open habitats? Owen. I think of all the panelists on this uh, webinar, I'm probably the least qualified <laughs> to um, answer this. Um, I mean, certainly, I would say from an FSC UK perspective, um, we absolutely um, do support expansion of um, UK forests. Um, uh, I also come from a family of farmers, so I'm acutely aware of um, some of the challenges there in terms of um, conflict with food production. One of my um, my uncle is um, he's prepared to buy up any part of mid Wales that anyone threatens to plant Sitka spruce on because he hates it so much. Goodness knows how I ended up with a career in forestry. Um, I, I don't really have an answer there. I mean, the valuable open habitats, um, I, I think there's um, that's been an interesting discussion um, in the current discussions in Aquas, uh, actually, is how do we make sure that whatever we're doing is not having an impact on 
um, on valuable open habitats. Um, unfortunately, a lot of people aren't seeking certification right at the beginning um, of woodland establishment, so our role there is is limited. But that is certainly something that we should be um, concerned about. Um, but really, I think I would I would defer to the expertise of uh, of others on this call, and especially um, Stuart, who's um, spoken elo very eloquently about this in the in the context of Aquas meetings. Thank you, Owen, and that also saves me from choosing the next person because you've already handed the ball on to Stuart. Yes, indeed. Um, yeah, it's it is a challenge. I, I personally don't think we it really threatens food production. Um, I mean, farmers love to uh, say, "Oh, we're all going to starve if we don't get to carry on doing what we're doing." Um, but I, I really don't think that's the case. Um, a lot of the ground that um, we would like to be planting trees on is actually very low productivity ground, um, generally speaking, with a few sheep. So I'm not quite sure that there is a threat to food production. There may be a threat to upland sheep farming, which is a different question and obviously a, a social question that perhaps needs asked. I think the food production one is, is a bit of a red herring. Valuable open habitats are traditionally the place where forestry has come into most conflict. And we were really thinking about moorland habitat here as much as anything else. And that's historically be because forestry has been pushed up the hill. I think what we're seeing now in actual fact is forestry going down the hill. So I think uh, in the future, the pressure on the really valuable open habitats will um, be reduced. However, and I allude back to something that uh, Rebecca said earlier about triple SIs, I think sometimes we think that we have a valuable open habitat when in actual fact it's a highly degraded one. Um, I, I, the, the, I think the, what Owen was referring to is the fact that I've often said in the Aquas meetings that you know 38 percent of Scotland is potentially moorland and open habitat for curlew. Yet curlew are still in decline. So my question is often, what is the matter with the moorlands that 38% of the land area of Scotland cannot support a valuable population of curlew? And if we take the same argument to Wales, there has been no afforestation in Wales to speak of for about 30 years, yet during that period, curlew have been in decline. So I think sometimes we say, oh, these are really valuable open habitats, and they may well be, but if they're going to be valuable open habitats, we actually have to start managing them like we would in Aquas, as if they were valuable open habitats. And if you like, and I've said this before, um, and Re Rebecca Whitefeld, sometimes we need to think about rewilding the moorlands as well. We can't just go on burning them at crisp forever. That perhaps didn't actually answer the question about how we avoid it, but there you go. <laughs> Thank you. Plenty of food for thought, and again, very kindly doing my job for me and passing a baton to Rebecca. Um, well, I would completely agree. I mean, why are we v valuing moorland habitat over, for instance, our native rainforests, which are a minute fraction of, of what they used to be, um, whereas the open moorland habitats are kind of artificially high in, in Britain because of, um, you know, the management for grouse moors um, and for deer stalking estates. So, I mean, what what I'd like to, I mean, having just spent my holiday in, um, uh, in both the uh, Yorkshire Dales and the York, North York Moors National Parks, um, I've seen th th these amazing walks up, up sort of river valleys with amazing regeneration um, of woodlands on both sides. And as soon as you get onto the top where they've been burning, it's, you know, bowling ball, bowling green, um, flat, uh, denuded of, of and, and you can see, you, I mean, you know, actually saw all the young trees that have been burned by the muir burn um, and the moorland burning. So it's, you know, who, who defines what's valuable um, and, and what which habitats we want to maintain um, and the level of maintenance. I mean, if we just let some of those habitats uh, go, they would return to woodlands and some, with some open habitats and a, a really interesting mosaic of, yes, hopefully moorland habitats, but also um, more uh, you know, forested and uh, woodlands and our, our amazing rainforests. You know, who, who are we to say 
that in the uh, Amazon they should st stop the um, chopping down their rainforests when we have a small fraction of our own. And I really don't think that there is a huge competition between that and food production, not least because I think it's 1.4 million hectares in Britain are, are grouse shooting estates and um, 1.8 million are, are deer stalking estates. So, um, and, and it's not to say that we, we um, should stop hunting or shooting necessarily, just a very different type of hunting and shooting that brings trees and woodlands back into to the landscape more. Um, so, and that would have very little impact on, on food production. Um, so I think there's, it, again, it comes back to that integrated approach. And I think we've had this sort of siloed approach and, um, and this kind of almost competition that is one or the other. And, and I'd like to see just a much richer mosaic of some areas, yes, managed uh, for moorland, um, but more natural regeneration. It, it would just happen naturally. We saw, I saw it on these walks I did. It, if it hadn't been burnt, that woodland would have climbed out of the valley sides and bottoms and, and, and onto the tops in a really interesting mosaic. Um, so I, I, I think the, it, this sort of um, polarization needs to stop. We need to come together and, and, and look at how to take that integrated approach. Thank you, Rebecca. And Maria, maybe you could um, um, get, give your sort of final take on this. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, I agree with Stuart completely. I don't think um, forest expansion threatens food production at all. There's plenty of um, low grade, unfertile farmland to go out before we even get anywhere near the, um, the more fertile stuff that crops are grown. And I don't think farmers are going to be in any hurry to, to, um, to plant those up unless the subsidies get uh, considerably increased. Um, but on the valuable open habitats, I think there just needs to be a balance. There needs to be, you know, I think the idea of a, of a forested landscape as a mosaic of habitats, it's not wall to wall trees. It's, it's got to be a mixture and it's got to cater for all the different, you know, make sure that we leave space for all the different habitats that, that we've got now, but also the, the potential for them. Great. Thank you, Maria. And I understand that one of the participants, um, um, has actually done a doctorate on this very question and so I think if Amy from FSC can work out the technology we might get a contribution from a participant. Um, that doesn't seem to be working so I'll perhaps come back to that when uh, if we can get Jim online um, so the next question um, for Rebecca um, do you have a priority um, in order for rewilding I'm not sure what the focus that in order for where we would start rewilding I suppose I would take it as as that um, um, I think there's lots of places to start. I mean, we've started a um, a rewilding network, partly because of the demand from people coming to us saying, we want to re rewild our, our land. How do we do it? Um, what's the process? Um, and so we've started a network as a, as a sort of peer learning group. Um, we'd love pe more people from, from the forestry sector to to want to become part of that because so that we can sort of diversify at the moment we've got conservation organizations we've got private landowners we've got public landowners um but we've uh and there's there's members with with some forestry on their land but it would be great to have some of the fsc accredited um woodlands for instance as as part of that sort of that combination of approaches so what we're wanting to do is support those that are wanting to rewild for multiple different reasons, for either for for economic reasons or, or um, um, legacy reasons. Um, but I think uh, the other thing that we're looking at is our, our national parks. Um, so in a sense, our priority would be we feel that they should lead the way. They should be the sort of shining examples of um, of this mosaic of, of of approaches and habitats and land uses that all work to enhance nature that are sort of nature positive but also carbon negative that um, work to sequester carbon um, so we think that that those national parks should be leading the way um, we're also just about to produce a report 
looking at nature-based economies so if you know the reality is if we're thinking if we're wanting and having the aspiration to support 30 percent in nature's recovery by 2030 we can't do that if the economy is working um uh, sort of classic the sort of economic incentives um are in opposition to nature's recovery so what we're going to we're proposing is that we establish nature-based economies across 30 percent of Britain as well to support that nature's recovery but also provide diversified economic opportunities for to enable local communities to prosper so I'm, I'm not quite sure that's asking the question but it's answering the question but it's um uh I wasn't quite sure what the what the fo focus of the question was Great, thank you, thank you, Rebecca. Th thanks very much for that. And um, I think we now have Jim online um, to also contribute to the question of whether the expansion of uh, of woodland cover threatens open habitat and food production. Jim, hi, hi. C can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Excellent. Yeah. So sorry about. That. So I, I won't cover open habitat because it's it's um it's not perhaps my area of expertise, but food security. Um, and forestry uh, certainly are. So the short answer is that the expansion of forestry, as as uh, we we kind of see it going forward um, with the government targets, would not be a threat to the United Kingdom's food security. Um, food security is defined in different ways depending on what level of you're looking at. So you know a state can be food secure, whereas individuals on the humanitarian sort of uh, food security paradigm might not be. But as a general rule, people in the United Kingdom are, are food secure. And that is a mixture of um, imports uh, for things that we can't grow in the United Kingdom, um, for example, a, um, olives and a, things that we can grow in the United Kingdom. So uh, uh, Stuart's absolutely correct in actually where, where forestry does tend to impact on agriculture, it tends to be um, sheep production. Um, which actually has a, a, a kind of a negative. So I think approximately uh, for every one kilogram of a, um, a um, sheep meat you produce, you produce about, I think, if I remember rightly, about, don't quote me on this, 13 to 16 kilograms of CO2. Whereas obviously for things like wheat production, that's down to around 0.8 kilograms of CO2 equivalent. So, so there's the environmental part of it as well. But food wise, no, um, you know, you would not affect the UK's food security. Um, and that's different from self-sufficiency, by the way. So the UK is not self-sufficient in food and it would not be self-sufficient in food, even if we tried. Um, you know, something like 71 percent of our land area is devoted to food production. Um, and that is constrained by the quality of that land. Um, and the amount of crop you can yield or animals you can yield from that land. So even if we decided to go all for our own self-sufficiency, we still wouldn't be able to do it and perhaps haven't been able to do it since about the Napoleonic Wars. So I hope that answers the question. Thanks, Jim. That's extremely helpful um, and 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 also very useful at the end to, to draw a distinction between self-sufficiency and food security. I, for one, couldn't give up um, a French wine, but there we. <laughs> thank you very much for that that uh, that, that 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 input. Um, so uh, the next question is, Rebecca, you're rather being put on the spot today, I'm afraid, uh, but it does say for Rebecca and anyone else. So perhaps, Rebecca, you could take the first answer and any of the other panellists who wish to uh, can contribute. And the question is, how do non-native species factor into aspirations for the recovery of UK nature? Ooh, another good question. Um, I mean, I suppose, I suppose for, for me, um, if you reinstate that um the, the complexity the sort of structural and functional comp complexity of naturally functioning ecosystems um then it brings a resilience it doesn't create those sort of open spaces for non-native species to move in and and take over i mean that's that's the problem i mean again in the walks that i've done in the in yorkshire up the rivers there was himalayan balsam all over the place but the question is, is it moving into a space in the ecosystem because the ecosystem isn't functioning properly? Um, so I'm less bothered about wiping out all non-native species um, rather than reinstating that um, that complexity, that kind of uh, intricate web of life, um, 
but I'm also less bothered about it because because of climate change. I mean, we know that um, climate zones are moving. Um, I think it would be um, about five kilometers a year. I think that was the figure that in our latest report. So what's what's native now might not be uh, what's non-native now might not be non-native in 10, 20 years time. Um, and and again, the resilience comes from allowing those locally adapted species and potentially new species to come in and build that complexity and resilience and and strength that you have in a, a much more complex naturally functioning ecosystem. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, would any of the other panelists like to contribute to that one, or shall we move on? Okay, let's move on to the next question, uh, which is um, for anyone. I'm going to start with Owen again, though, just to give you a second's warning. Um, so this question is, with increasing pests, diseases and extreme weather inevitable, should the UQAS and forest sector aim to move away from clear fell to continuous cover? So I'm going to start off with Owen and then go to Stuart. Um, that's, those were the first two respondents. Owen. Okay, well, I have to um, declare a vested interest here, if you like, because uh, I am a member of the Continuous Cover Forestry Group, and um, I used to be the Wales coordinator for that group, and my previous research, limited research career was largely around um, CCF or alternatives to Clearfell, whichever way you want to want to come at this. So my personal view is yes, um, but uh, I mean, within the context of um, FSC, FSC calls for ecologically appropriate silvicultural practices um, and I think these are exactly the sorts of things we need to take into account although not only these things um, there's also the the carbon implications uh, in particular um, and also biodiversity implications um, of your balance of silvicultural approaches and I think the reality is um, we are going to continue to see for the foreseeable future um, a range of silvicultural approaches in UK forestry, but it is my personal view that we should be shifting the balance further towards the um, the continuous cover end of things. Uh, and these are absolutely discussions that are ongoing at the moment within the Aquas Working Group. Thank you, Owen. Stuart? Yes, I I'm largely agree with Owen. I think where it is silviculturally possible to move away from clear fell to a more continuous cover system. It's something that we should absolutely be encouraging. However, I, I cut my forestry teeth in the 80s in Estill Muir, and I defy anybody to operate a continuous cover system in Estill Muir. <laughs> it just ain't gonna happen. And unfortunately, as for historical reasons, a significant chunk, certainly with my, my Scottish perspective, a significant chunk of the forests that we have in the UK or on ground that you would struggle to operate a continuous cover system on. Um, having said that, we've got a couple of really interesting um, places where I'm managing continuous cover, including um, Barnes Court in Northern Ireland, where they're doing continuous cover spruce, Sitka spruce, would you believe? So um, anything's possible on the right side, yes. Great, thank you very much. Uh, Rebecca and Maria, I don't know if you either of you would like to contribute? To that? No, okay, we'll move on. So I think we have time for one more question, um, possibly two. Um, so the next question is, what do the panel think about forest zoning and more varied silvicultural systems? So I think part of that was, was perhaps touched on in the previous question. Um, uh, maybe I could start off with Stuart on this one, and then uh, then Rebecca, Maria, and Owen. Um, yeah, uh, my previous answer is <laughs> in many ways to this one. Um, yeah, um, I'd like to see more varied silvicultural systems. Um, at the end of the day, we foresters pride ourselves on being silviculturalists. At the end of the day, so. Uh, yeah, my previous answer to Farris. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, I can't remember who I said was next now. Maria, thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, I think 
definitely variety is and you know i don't think anybody is going to say that it works to just have one one set of silver cultural systems so i think we need to be there needs to be where it's appropriate different systems um that's it Thank you. I, I think also part of this question is, is forest zoning, which I take to mean a sort of, you know, a, a plan for what kind of forest should be where, should be in what place. So maybe Rebecca, you could sort of speak to that aspect of the question. Well, I think I think this is really, I mean, this is the aspect that I'm in a sense most interested in is um, if we were to take, as you know, an area, um, say an area for one of these integrated local plans that I was talking about, maybe a catchment or, um, and you looked at that area and said, so, okay, so if we want to maximize, well, food production, but also timber and other forest products, but also rewilding and nature's recovery and, and you know, carbon drawdown, what would we do across this landscape? Where would we um, have forestry? Where would we allow natural regeneration? Where would we have farming and food production? And I'm really interested. So please contact me anyone who in in models um that work both eco economically um and ecologically so i was talking about this kind of as part of the component of 30 percent in nature's recovery by 2030 we'd love to see at least five percent of that um as core rewilding but 25 percent this kind of idea of much more varied mixed um production systems um and i'd be really interested in any approaches that you know of 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 different types of or different silver cultural systems and how they work out economically as well as 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 ecologically. Um, if you went for different types of um, silver cultural production and what what is our our niche in Britain in terms of what is most productive, what can our land give most productively? Um, so I'd be really interested in in any approaches that are existing or any lessons that are being learned from other countries, for instance, about how you might mix natural regeneration, rewilding. Um, and um, low impact civil cultural systems in an economically viable way. Great, thank you very much, Rebecca. Owen. I think I'm in danger of answering this one with more of an old hat on as, a, um, as someone who led a, um, a planning team in Forestry Commission Wales, but I think it is, I think it is relevant to certification because of course we were guided by Aquas as much as anything. And I think it is, uh, valid in a course which does um, steer people towards ecologically appropriate species choice and silver cultural choice um, I would absolutely understand this in terms in terms of zoning the areas available to us in terms of the species options on those sites and the silver cultural options on those sites and certainly we were doing that at a district level um, but I think there are some quite interesting angles to this now you know it's, it's interesting that Stuart mentioned Eskdale Muir earlier yeah silver cultural and, and species options there are limited um you know we shouldn't but we shouldn't take the fact that a site is hard as a reason to sort of give up on it or, or walk away from it but in an area where species choice is limited where silver cultural choice is limited in areas which are remote and you know when we need to look at the sort of full impact of forestry and you think about um, road haulage distances and things like that that these are the areas where we should think be thinking well perhaps our best option here is more of a hands-off approach maybe it's more about biodiversity reservoirs carbon reservoirs um, protection of water catchments and shifting our focus to those areas those zones if you like where we have more species options, more silvicultural options, um, higher productivity levels, um, shorter haulage distances. Um, I mean, I'm all in favour for thinking along those lines, and, and I think Aquas does go some way towards um, promoting that. But but maybe that's a further conversation to be had. Right, that's a super answer. Thank you, Owen. Um, I'm looking at time. I if I could ask the panelists to answer this, the, the next question literally in a sentence, that would be really helpful because I, I think this will have to be the last uh, question. Uh, but to all of you, how worried are you about insect, insect pests? Sorry, I'll start again. How worried are you about insect pest threats to forests? Um, who would like to start? Stuart, can I put you on the spot? Okay. Um, cautiously optimistic. 
um, that uh, although insect pests will inevitably move around, that with improved biosecurity and early warning, we can limit their impact. Um, I think the ones that really worried me in terms of pests are not the insects, but the fungi and the viruses and things like that, because usually you, by the time you know you've got those, they're out of control. Brilliant, thank you. Um, Owen, Rebecca, Maria, anything to add to that? Uh, I think what Stuart said is is very true, but uh, maybe I'm just more pessimistic than him, but I'm still very worried about insect pests for what it's worth. <laughs> Great. So look, um, thank you very much, everyone, uh, for your questions. Unfortunately, we have run out of time because there's a little bit of any other business at the end. Um, some great questions there. And thank you very much um, to Owen, Rebecca, Stuart and Maria for not only their presentations, but also for really engaging with some uh, some fascinating and challenging questions. Um, we will try to answer your, uh, or provide some answers to, to, to questions um, by in emails um, after this meeting has closed. Um, so maybe Owen, we could advance to the next slide. Um, so so um, I'm going to close the meeting shortly, uh, but before I do, we have another task for you on Slido, which is to share your thoughts on um, any topics you would like to dis discuss in future meetings like this. Um, you know, hopefully at some point we could actually meet physically as well as uh, uh, as well as remotely for this kind of uh, for this kind of conversation. Um, I'd also to point people towards the fact that the uh, UK Woodland Assurance Standard at COAS is in revision, um, and there will be a public cons it will be out for public consultation, which I think is the second round of public consultation between October and November of this year. So please uh, do contribute to that because the rich uh, the rich information. Uh, questions and perspectives we've had today just really shows um, how important it is to get all of those perspectives um, into a responsible forestry standard. Um, and if you have any specific questions on the FSC or, or FSC Forest Management uh, Certification in the UK, please contact Owen um, at the uh, uh, email address below, which is owen at fsc.uk.org. Um, so as I say, we're going to use Slido one more time in the last couple of minutes, which is for you to suggest uh, topics for further meetings. So if you type away in Slido, hopefully a word cloud will appear by magic. Um, so um, please, you know, what would you like to talk about next? What, what, what sort of questions do you have about UK woodlands? Um, and what they should be delivering for us, how to improve them? What do we want for them? So we have one, which is what is a forest? And also, I think if you, I think you can either vote for ones that other people have put, or if you put the same word in, it will get bigger relative to the uh, arrest. So it looks like we are getting at the moment a clear winner, which is what is a forest, which uh, in the context of the UK, as, as many of you know far better than I do, has a very interesting historical and social um, angle to it um, as well. Um, I'm just going to keep this open for another few seconds. But good range of suggestions there.
Great. Um, how certification can support future mortal benefits for forestry, nature, and society? So we have two um, two ones that are popular, but also some very interesting other ones. Integrating rewild what rewilding with forest management, education, continuous cover forestry, uh, forest expansion, management, profit, small woodlands, tree health, scale um, education. And if you do have any other thoughts about what you'd like uh, to have as the topic uh, for a future webinar, please do email the FSC. So uh, I'm just going to close the meeting now. We're, we're out of time. I would once again like to thank our panellists, Owen, Rebecca, Stuart and Maria. I'd also really like to thank the team at FSC who have done all of the hard work in pre preparing for this and getting all of the technology to work, which is you know, no small achievement. So thank you, Amy and colleagues at uh, FSC. Um, and thank you very much to everyone who participated today. I think we've heard some fantastic things, but also some really great challenging uh, and intriguing questions. So, um, so I'm gonna close the meeting here. Thank you, everybody. Bye. <laughs>